Welcome back to another segment of Courageous Man or Foolish Man. I am a King James Bible believer, so we'll be going through the King James Bible today. I believe it's God's perfect written word in English. If you want to know why, you can ask, ask me in the comment section. I'll link some videos and tell you why. So, Courageous Man or Foolish Man? Noah. This was a great study. I mean, I'm sitting here. Even right now, I'm sitting here, I'm seeing part of the ocean out there, and we're talking about Noah and the flood. So we're going to go to Genesis 6, verse 1, if you want to turn there. Now, mainly the whole points of this story we're going to get to is not leaving your habitation and not giving in to the lost world and trusting God. No matter how bad things get, you trust God. Genesis 6, 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of which they chose. Now I stopped there for a second, and I'm like, hmm, sons of God, angels? They took wives? But in Matthew 22, 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And I started wrapping my brain about this, and I'm like, I know the Bible doesn't con contradict. Just because I don't understand something doesn't mean the Bible contradicts. So I asked a couple brothers in Christ, and one of them sent me this uh, Jude 1.6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Okay. In heaven angels do not marry. But they can leave and procreate with women on earth. Now on a side note, uh, and, uh, I was told by a brother, in fact the Bible shows that they prefer feminists that have no male authority in their life. 1 Corinthians 11.10 For this cause ought the women to have power on her head because of the angels. 1 Corinthians 11.1-12 is about male authority in marriage. An uncovered woman is one without spiritual male covering. Now, I don't know if you've looked, I don't surf the, the internet, I don't surf YouTube purposely trying to look for stuff, like research as much. Um, I love just studying the Bible, following good Bible-believing ministries. Every once in a while I get dragged to a false ministry professing to be a Bible-believing one to watch a video. But sometimes in the suggested videos you'll have, I've seen a lot of women that will come out and say, I've seen an angel. I've seen Jesus Christ. And yes, you do have men doing it, but for the majority of it, just what I've come across is a lot of women doing it. And they haven't seen Jesus Christ. They haven't seen one of His angels. Okay? They've seen Satan and His angels. Jesus is in heaven right now. He's not here on earth. So for someone to say, I saw Jesus right there, uh, they're seeing a devil, a demon. But I had to throw that part in there because a lot of people like me would have been like, wait a minute, marriage? So the angels came down, they left their habitation, and that's going to be key here in this study. They left their first habitation to come down here. Why'd they leave that hab habitation? Look at all these beautiful women. The flesh. I'm not saying they had the flesh, but I'm just, you know what I'm saying? It's that desire other than spiritual. The habitation of a Christian. Let's talk about the habitation of a Christian. They left their habitation. And I need to get this right away because people say, what about the changed life? The old man, you didn't leave that habitation for a new habitation. The old man is dead and buried with Christ. This is your reborn. You're born into this habitation that we're going to talk about. Your Christian habitation. It's part of your changed life. You are born again. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. So the habitation of a Christian, the number one habitation of a Christian, the Word of God. That's why we stress, Bible-believing Christians, not King James only, but Bible-believing Christians stress so much that there is a perfect written word in English, um, there's a perfect written word in German, and German language, and French 
I think I've been told French and Spanish. Those three, they've been backed up by the King James Bible. They line up. Um, so I'm not a King James only. It's just you only need one Bible in English. You don't need 300 Bibles in English. Our English language is not changing that much. And it's not changing that fast. It's being perverted, our English language. Um, but it's not changing that much. So I believe the King James Bible is God's perfect written word. But I spend every morning in it, every evening in it. I do Bible studies every day. And I'm not bragging, but I'm talking about the habitation of a Christian. Your first habitation is this. Because when you're reading this, they say the King James Bible is the only bi book that when you read it, the author's present every time. The more you spend in this, the more you're spending with the Lord. This is a habitation of a Bible-believing Christian. The next habitation of a Bible-believing Christian, prayer. How often do you spend in, in prayer? Oh, I say a little prayer before I eat. Oh, I say a little prayer before I go to bed. Uh, that's becoming more like tradition lately to me. I've realized I still pray before I eat. I'm not a hypocrite. And I pray hardcore before I go to bed, talking about my whole day, the things I did wrong, the things God blessed me with, giving Him glory for everything, and thanking Him for everything, which is part of prayer, the two parts, giving thanks in all things, giving God the glory in all things. And then I went ahead and had a third one, uh, praying for the brethren. Okay, But the habitation of a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, another part of the habitation, one habitation, another part is prayer. You're to be in prayer. You're, the Bible says you're to pray without ceasing. Um, I talk with the Lord all the time. I'll sit here. I'll look at the beautiful creation that God has made. I'll be playing, um, gosh, I forgot their name, but a young lady, uh, country style, had, they bought their CD, and I'll link it below, and it's just guitar music. No words, and she's picking the guitar to old hymns and stuff. And I play that, and I'm sitting here, and I just talk with the Lord for hours. Um, when I'm on the beach, I have my uh, memory card verses, and I'm walking, and I'm saying, trying to memorize them, and then I talk to the Lord about what they mean. Sometimes the Lord shows me something right then and there. Um, because it goes back to this, habitation, the habit, this part of the habitation, which is a big part, and prayer, which is a big part. Okay, prayer needs to be a big thing in your life. Um, and these last days, I keep pushing the brethren. I'm so surprised that we are not, that I pr am not getting tons of prayer requests. Uh, Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, ex-Catholics for Christ, um, that people aren't on there left and right saying, I need prayer for this, I need prayer for that. I mean, prayer is a big, big part of a Christian's life. Talking with the Lord and having a personal relationship with God. Okay? Now, I already said that I'm King James only, and I'll do a quick thing. King James Bible comes from the Texas Receptus. It's based by over, it started out with 95% of all Greek manuscripts. It's like having a gold bar that's 95% gold. Now, it's, after all the manuscripts that have been recently found, it got up to 98 to 99% is backed. This is what it's backed by, 90% gold bar. All the other versions afterwards are based off of less than 1%. They're mostly junk metal, junk. So this is the habitation of a Bible-believing Christian, the King James Bible. How many people are leaving that habitation for the new versions? How many people who are professing to be saved are staying in the habitation of the new versions and not coming over and getting saved, letting the old man die, getting saved so they can live in the new habitation? All right. The angels left their first habitation, which was heaven, and came down to earth. Okay. I will not leave the habitation I'm supposed to be in as a Christian. Right. Now I talked about not being conformed to the world. And the other thing was, uh, ye adulteresses and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Whosoever, therefore, got it right. 
one of my memory verses. Um, it takes great courage to stay in the habitation of a Christian. Today, you're getting hammered so hard. Uh, this isn't God's perfect word. There is no perfect word. Right? It's, it's You're the opinion. You're the foundation. It's about feelings and opinions. You're the final authority. God's not the, I mean, God's still the final authority, but through you. Not through His Word, not through the Holy Spirit, but through you, God is the final authority. In other words, it's a lie. You're trying to be the final authority. How many Christians that stood for the King James Bible left their first habitation, sometimes the Bible says your first love, for another habitation, the Bible perversions. How many people le left the true gospel, because we're talking about prayer, left the true gospel of repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and then prayer, calling on the name of the Lord, confessing both in prayer and then calling on the name of the Lord. How many people stood for that, and now they've turned their backs on it. They left it for another habitation. They went from praying to the one true God, Jesus Christ, God fully and completely, God, uh, Jesus Christ who's God manifest in the flesh, who's the fullness of the Godhead bodily, how many people have left that to praying to the true God in Jesus' name, the real Jesus, for the Trinity, the fake Jesus, the fake God, all lowercase g gods, three gods. How many people are leaving their first habitation? And this, is, this whole series is about encouraging the brethren to have courage. Have courage. Look to Noah as a good example. We'll get to that point of the two habitations that were on here on earth. We'll get to that point. But have courage. Don't let the cares of this world around you get you to leave your first habitation. The King James Bible prayer and... One thing on here too is fellowship. I'm going to skip that one. The true habitation of a Christian is among brothers and sisters in Christ. Not the lost world. You're not to be hanging out with them having a good time with lost people. Okay. Now, i got to set this down and explain because people are always going to bend it and try to justify being part of the world, all these fake Christians, fake Bible-believing Christians, and then all these Christians that go to these Bible buildings where they're inviting lost people in with them. The true habitation of a Bible-believing Christian is, I'm worried about the wind, is um, among brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I understand these last days, it's tough. It is so tough to have physical, like physical contact with brothers and sisters in Christ. I wish I could invite a lot of the pe brethren that I talk to and sisters in Christ I talk to, I wish I could invite their families and invite them over and have a Bible study right here on the deck during, that's beautiful during the summer. Uh, true fellowship, praying with each other. Um, I usually mostly pray for people because I think prayer should be between you and God. It's not something you sit there and say, okay, I'm going to pray with you uh, you pray to the Lord, I pray to the Lord. And sometimes, you know, you can pray as a group, like Jesus did, thanking Him for the food, and bless this food, Lord. There are certain times where you pray together, but most of your prayer life should be single, one-on-one -on -one between you and the Lord. But I wish I could invite all these people over, but we're so spread thin, and we're all over the globe. A lot of the people I talk to sometimes are in other countries, uh, halfway across the United States. I understand that. But when you get online, you should be spending most of your time trying to talk to Bible-believing Christians and following true Bible-believing ministries. Okay. Now this video, I'm not trying to attack any ministries, that's why I'm not mentioning anything true or false. But you need to find some true Bible-believing ministries that stick to the King James Bible. They don't bring in other sources. They don't try to correct the Bible, Bible correctors. They stick to what the Bible says. They don't bring in terms from elsewhere that aren't found in the Bible. Okay, Bible believing ministries. Uh, so uh, ex, I don't. I was going to start doing it, but I'm going to mention Exit Catholics for Christ because their main ministry is street preaching, preaching the gospel. But your habitation as a Christian, the third part of your habitation is going to be among brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Your conversation is going to be with them. Now, I help my neighbor out. I do. I go fishing with my neighbor sometime. I get fresh fish. It helps me with my budget. I don't have to spend as much money on food. I'm trying to eat healthy. I talk with him. Um, I've mentioned I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I went to talk to him about Jesus Christ. He's one of a million people that got burnt out on religion. He's an atheist now, and he got burnt out on religion growing up. Um, that's the tough thing of this world when it comes to preaching the gospel. So I do spend time with him when I go fishing. Uh, when he needs help, you can still help the lost world. But I'm saying I don't fellowship with the lost world. I don't go hang out. I got invited to his house for, I think it was New Year's. He had a lot of his family down, and I was meeting a lot of his family, and I give God the glory all the time in front of him, in front of lost people. I give God thanks all the time. I caught a huge, if you've seen my picture on Facebook, I caught a huge steelhead the first time I went fishing, and I kept praising the Lord and thanking the Lord in front of him and all the other fishermen that were there on the uh, Chetco River. And I, I always give God the glory. But when I was there, we started eating, and then after lunch, they started breaking out wine, beers, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't do this, and I don't want this in front of me. And I told them that, and respectfully, I left. I didn't make an excuse. Well, you know, I think I left the stove on. I, I gotta go. Uh, sometimes I do that, and it's wrong. You say why you're not gonna stay, you let them know that it's a sin, and you leave. And I left. You're not to fellowship with the lost world, and you're not to stick around and, and spend time with the lost world when they're in sin. The Bible says you're to abstain from all appearance of evil. Most of my time, I don't spend with the lost world. Okay, uh, Lost world really doesn't like me. I hand out gospel tracts on the beach. Um, I leave gospel tracts everywhere I go when I go to town, which isn't often. It used to be two times a week, but with me doing the... Uh, Bible by the ocean side, then I added the um, worship by the ocean side, and I'm going to be doing a new segment that I'm going to start trying to do in the forestry area that's going to be neat. But uh, I've been trying to go to, t I've been going to town more often than I normally do. But the point is, the habitation of a Christian is among brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, not among the lost world. Okay. Let's see if I left anything out that I wanted to say. It takes great courage to stay in the habitation of a Christian. Today we have cares of the world all around us, the temptation of the flesh, but even worse today we have a lot of false converts in wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, false religions that love to call themselves Christians. People try to get you to leave the habitation that a Bible-believing Christian is, whether they're trying to get you to leave the Word of God for a Bible perversion or praying to the true God, to a false God trying to get you to invite lost people in and, and let false people come in and sow seeds of corruption and corrupt people. Okay. I've seen, just on another side note, I've seen people that get saved, newly saved, they come out and want to do videos right away, and I've told people that I understand time's getting short, and I understand people just get this desire they want to do something for the ministry. Um, believe it or not, uh, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you need to study you need to study the Word of God for a while. You need to pray for a good while. You need to hang out with brothers and sisters in Christ for a good while before you start throwing videos up. But I've seen people throw videos up that I believe are truly saved, and they've got such love for the King James Bible and for the truth, and then as you watch their videos, they start talking about how they're hanging out with false King James Bible believers and teachers. And I'm thinking to myself, and I even tell them, hey, this person's false. This is what he teaches. It goes against the King James Bible. And they're like, well, I know, but he's got some other good teachings. And I tell them, you need to stay away from that person because they're going to mess you up. And the next thing you know, they get messed up. Why? Because they left the habitation of only fellowshipping with true Bible-believing Christians. Okay. Uh, Verse 3 in Genesis 6. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Why did the angels leave their habitation? I, their bodies are different than ours, I understand that. But I, like I said, if they saw the women were beautiful and lusted after him, you know, what can I say? Yet his days shall be a, an hundred and twenty years. 
Now, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Get a hold of that one. Did you know there will be so-called giants today in so-called Christianity? Uh, people of renown, people of the faith, and they're so popular with the world, the lost world. You have people quoted, quoting so-called church fathers instead of the Bible. How many people come across people who do that? How many people come across ministries where it's about... Um, this is widely accepted among the people. Um, it's based off your feelings and opinions. Uh, and they'll quote uh, church fathers. They'll say, well, church fathers such and such. The church fathers always believe this, and the church fathers that, and the church fathers this. And they're not quoting this. Okay. Uh, let's see. Men of the past, men of renown. Let's see, and when these so-called church fathers add to or subtract from the Word of God, we are supposed to go with them and ignore God's Word. Yeah, and even today it's the same way. You've got these so-called leaders in uh, so-called Christianity, and you're not supposed to question them. You have all these false teachers, prophets and preachers, false men of God that are considered giants. great example is Billy Graham, big guy in the, in the preaching, you know. The world loves him. He's hanging out with a lot of s Satanists, uh, the Catholic Church and everything, and he's supposed to be a good preacher. Uh, false men of God that are considered giants. Um, Rick Warren, mighty men of the faith. Joel Hosting. I mean, these people are renowned and they're known. And a lot of people are like, man, they're so famous, and they're so renowned, and, and they got perfect teeth, and, and they're wearing suits and ties, and they've got these huge, beautiful brick battle buildings, and I think one of them bought out a uh, stadium, and it's like, these people are so great, eye-pleasing, and I want to be part of that. This is important, because Moses, or Moses, Noah saw the world what it was, all these men of renown, and did he say, you know what, I want to be with them. No, he didn't. He was courageous to say separate from them. doesn't matter how famous they are, how great they are. And today you need to have the same attitude, brethren. You need to have the same I don't care how famous they are. I don't care how popular they are. I don't care that they wear a suit and a tie and they look all nice. It comes down to this. What does the God's Word say? Not how big of a building he's got. Not that they have programs for the children. What does God's Word say? Now, another thing is, is these giants and these men of renown, uh, they're supposed to be people to fear. Never question them. Never question their salvation. You know, a lot of people say, you know, who are you to judge them, whether they're saved or lost, when the Bible warns us about false brethren, fakes, frauds, wolves in sheep's clothing, time and time again. Apostle Paul uh, never ceased to warn us night and day with tears about false brethren, about wolves in sheep's clothing coming in, warning us, telling us we're to judge according to this book. You don't let Satan into your fellowship. You don't let Satan into the body of Christ, because that's what you're doing when you invite lost people in. That's what you're doing when you find out someone's lost, oh, but we can't judge their salvation. We can't judge it. No, nope, we can't. They're famous. They're renowned. They're giants. And the Christian movement, even some in the Babel, bil uh, Babel building, uh, Bible-believing movement that are false, okay, you're not to question their salvation. You're not to question their teaching. I mean, you can disagree, but we have to agree to disagree. It's all, we all have to get along. You can disagree with them, but you're not to question their teaching. Mm -hmm. You're not to call them out and tell them that they're wrong 100% and they need to repent. Okay, You're not to do that. We're just supposed to all get along. 
and you're absolutely not to judge their sin. I've heard so many stories in these ba uh, Babel buildings that, and I close my eyes sometimes, I realize because of a little bit of a glare. These Babel buildings, and it's happened to me too, where you have people, having adults having sex with teenagers, underage women. Uh, you've got fornication going on. You've got all kinds of wickedness going on. But you're not to judge people's sins. You're not to judge that. We all need to come together and get along. We, we're supposed to have unity. Okay. Among the brothers and sisters in Christ who stand by the written word of God, the do's, the don'ts, that hold people accountable, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have unity. It's when you want to bring sin in and tell us we can't judge people's sin. And you've got these giants and these people that have that attitude. It's all about love. You know. And what do these people give you? These giants, these people of renown. Okay? They give you the world. You can keep your sin and have your best life now. now who, <laughs> who do we know that wrote a book like that? Uh, what do these people look okay. at? What did Satan tempt Jesus with? Luke 4, 5. And the devil came, and the devil, taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdom of the world in a moment of time and the devil said unto him all this power will I give thee and the glory of them for that it delivereth that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it if thou therefore wilt worship me all shall be thine yes so so you have all these false teachers pushing easy believism they are trying to get you to worship their Satan, I mean Antichrist, I mean Jesus, their Jesus. I even wrote it that way. Now the key is turning the page. You can have the world and be a Christian basically. You know, your kingdom can be down here on earth, your heaven can be here on earth. You can feed your flesh, have power and control. In other words, you're the founder of authority. That's the big thing about people don't want a King James Bible. They don't want a perfect written word of God because they want to have the power and they want to have the control. They want to be the final authority. They don't want God to be the final authority. So they offer them the power and control. Okay? They, they offer them that the, they can feed their flesh and live fleshly and still be a Christian. You can live life your way. That's what these giants, men of renown, Noah wasn't like that. Noah's like, I'm going to live God's way. Noah was courageous and not given in to the world. When the Bible goes against what you want, these, these giants again, these men of renown, when the Bible goes against what you want, ignore it. They teach you ignore it. We don't want to fight about it. We don't want to cause you know division. Just ignore it. Do what you want and just ask God for forgiveness later. Okay. And they're also pushing that if this King James Bible, because the Bible talks about how it pierces your heart, it's a sword, and God knows your heart, and this right here points out your every sin. Uh, I, don't, I want this to be okay, so what do we do? We cast that Bible to the side and go to the Bible versions. We shop around to a Bible that goes easy on sin, and has a lighter attitude towards sin, or maybe is it even okay with the sin I want to do? So, they leave their habitation. A lot of people that are saved will leave their habitation for that reason, so they can have sin in their life. They can justify sin, they can justify their flesh, and even have the control, was it the power of control to be the final authority. Once again, two habitations in the Old Testament. And the New Testament for an individual man or woman, God or Satan. There's two habitations in the Old Testament. God or Satan. And you know what? There's a new habitation in, in the New Testament. God or Satan. It's always been the two habitations. Which one are you going to choose? Noah chose God. The rest of the world, I'm talking about the rest of the world chose Satan. Satan tells him and feeds their flesh. You can have your flesh. You can have this world. I own this world. You can have it. Now he doesn't own it, but he has dominion over this world. Okay. 
Back to Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, can we relate that to today? Okay. Does it sound a lot like today? How many people can attest that when they look out in the world, it just looks like, it just feels like every man's thought is continually wicked? How they dress, what they're into, they reject God, they want nothing to do with God, and there's so many professing Christians that want nothing to do with the capital G, God the Father. They don't want to do, have anything to do with Jesus Christ, who is God. The real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. You've got wolves in sheep's clothing coming in and trying to pervert the Bible-believing movement and the teachings of the Bible, the King James Bible. How many people look out there and see that? Everywhere you look, you see evil continually. Man's heart today is becoming like in the days of Noah, and mostly is. I mean, you go out there and you try to witness to people, those who've gotten the courage. I started out with not doing anything because I just didn't have the courage. I spent like my first two years just studying the Bible. I would talk about Jesus, but I just didn't have that courage. Then I started out small, handing out gospel tracts, or not handing them out, laying them everywhere. Then God gave me the courage to hand, hand them out. And then I would talk to people about the Bible version issue. But when you get to that point where you're actually physically talking to people, you'll notice that the world is wicked, even if they profess to be saved. Uh -huh. You look at their life and it's wicked. Matthew 24, 37, But as in the days of Noah were, so shall, the, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now I know that this is talking about the end of time, the time of Jacob's trouble. I understand that. But we're getting there. It doesn't just go, overnight it's done. Overnight, we're, we're a godly nation, and then tomorrow, the next day, we're a satanic, evil, wicked nation. No, the, America has gotten where it is now over time. Satan has infiltrated, pulled people away from their first habitation. Our government used to stand by the Bible. Now it doesn't. Uh, our government was a terror to evil. Now it's a terror to good. Okay. But can we see a lot of that today? Yes, we can. Only safely... Okay. The only safely... I can't say right. The only safe, godly place for a Bible-believing Christian today, and you can comment to say amen... I agree, because I know a lot of you do, the only safe place for you is your home. It's the only place that you can make a godly home where you don't have sinfulness and wickedness in your present presence all the time. You're the only place you can truly abstain from all appearance of evil. And don't get me wrong, there's still times I go through my house and I go, some, that's just bothered me for some reason. I don't know why it bothers me. And I think I've told the story before about the ashtray I got from Thailand. It's a souvenir from another country. I thought it was like a little plate. And I, the Lord's like, uh, you need to look at that closer. And I kept walking by because I have a cabinet that's glass and it displays a lot of stuff I got overseas. And, and my turtle collection. And he kept saying, hey, you know what? You need to really look at that closer. So I opened it up and I pulled it out and it wasn't a plate. It had fuzz in the bottom. It had a little circle and then it came up and then it had a design and it was an ashtray. And as I looked closer, it had false gods on it. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I threw that sucker out in a heartbeat. But the, I understand that people are still doing that today. But your home is the only place where you can abstain from all appearance of evil. And how many people that profess to be saved, and I believe some are and some aren't, that if God was to go through their home, they'd be disgusted. You're still watching movies and Hollywood movies, TV shows, you're playing video games, uh, you're listening to secular worship music, uh, secular music along with so-called worship music that's satanic style. Uh, I've had so many brothers and sisters say, hey, what about this song or that song? When I was newly saved, I was talking to some people, and I was like, I was into music big time. I played the bass guitar in the so-called worship team at my Babel building growing up. I played the acoustic guitar. I played the tuba, the trombone. Uh, I knew how to read music and play music. And when, after I got saved, uh, YouTube hated the video Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries had out, and it was called The Devil's Music. 
and I went through that and I was blessed to be able to download it before YouTube kicked it off. And I was like, I, yes, I understand. I can attest to that. When the beat, the rhythm overpowers the melody, it's fleshly. And when I did music, I understand the only reason, the only reason for rhythm is to keep time. That's it. It's to keep everybody in time, playing together in unison at the exact same time. That's what rhythm's for. When you get beat where it thump, 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 or you get worship music where it starts out quiet and peaceful and then it gets really loud and you can hear the drums really good and everything. That's satanic style music. It pleases the flesh. There's no call for it. Rhythm is just to keep the time. Keep everybody playing together. Right? Kind of like having one Bible, everybody reads together, it's not confusion because you're reading the exact same verse. You read tons of Bible versions together at the same time, it's a mess. Okay? Rhythm is only, um, and this is a side note, but yeah, rhythm is just to keep time. But your home is supposed to be the only place, especially today, talking about how bad the world's getting, that is a godly place for you, a safe place for you. Anytime I go into town, I see nothing but wickedness before my eyes. They modestly dressed women. So bad, it's like, it's almost like, I don't want to vex anybody. Teenagers dressing so bad. Um, adults, you got elderly women, because I'm a guy. So, uh, and I know that's evident, right? So I don't really watch the guys as much as a sister in Christ would. So my experience mostly is with the women. And... I told you in my testimony how before I got saved I was addicted to porn and there's porn in everything. I don't care what people try to justify. There's porn in the movies, uh, and modestly dressed women, and insinuating sex, all kinds of stuff in movies, TV shows, video games, everything's done today, advertisement to elicit a sexual response. Porn is everywhere. So it is difficult for me to go to town and see all these immodestly dressed women walking by seeing these magazines of like People Magazine and everything and immodestly dressed women on there. Um, it's wicked. My home is the only safe place. I got rid of the movies, rid of the TV shows, rid of the video games, and even to this day I'm still going through and God's hit me sometimes. What about this? What about that? Your home is the only safe place today. I understand, brothers and sisters in Christ. It is very horrid out there. It's like their thoughts are only continually, is wicked continually out there. I struggle with the flesh, and sometimes my brain starts going off in the wrong direction. I'll start thinking of a movie. I'll start thinking this. When I get down there and I see these women, I start thinking bad things. And I'm like, Lord, I, ha I always carry verses on me now always carry verses when I go into town. Sometimes I'll forget and I'll get so frustrated and angry with myself. I always carry uh, cue cards with Bible verses on them. I have a little stack that's gospel message verses. I have a stack of um, key scriptures every Christian should know. And eventually I'll do stacks of like eternal security, uh, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, just, just stacks where you're getting these verses in your head. But I'll pull it out or I'll just try to quote scripture in my head. Lord. You know, uh, abstain from all appearance of evil. Help me, Lord. Um, and right now, sometimes my brain goes blank. Um, you know, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, for God so loved the world. You know, just quoting scripture in your head to, to avoid that. I understand how wicked it is out there. And I have a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ that can attest to how wicked it is in their area. There's some out there that I pray for that they're the only Christian, they feel like it, and they probably are, the only Bible-believing Christians surrounded by Catholicism in these other countries, the Catholic Church. And that's what we are surrounded by. Um, Catholics posing as Christians. Catholics posing as Bible-believing Christians. Okay, Trying to pull people back under the traditions of the Catholic Church. So, hey... Be good. Stop it. Let's see. Back to verse 6 in, the P in Genesis. I think it's Genesis chapter 6, verse 6. Um, and it takes 
real quick, it takes a lot of courage, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm proud of you, but it takes a lot of courage to stay away from that habitation of the lost world and to stay in the habitation of a Christian. I understand it takes great courage, and I'm proud of those who have turned their home into a godly home, a God-fearing home, that have allowed God to go through and say with the Holy Spirit, hey, something's wrong with that. Some of it's just obvious. You go through when you first get saved and you take a lot of stuff and you get rid of it. There's a huge, to me, there's a big change in your life shortly after you get saved. You start throwing stuff out. You start changing your attitude towards sin and your language gets cleaned up. It takes a lot of courage to do what you guys do and then have lost family come in. You don't have TV. I've had people tell me that. You don't have television? You don't have a TV in your living room? No. Where the TV used to be? I got a fish tank. <laughs> and I think I've linked this video too on, on it. I bought a fish tank. That's what I wanted there. I said, Lord, I don't want to look at the TV. Um, I used to use that TV when I moved in here for watching Bible studies and everything. And you hook my computer up to it and you can watch Bible studies. And it was a big TV, but I said, you know what, Lord? I just want this living room to be a reading room. And during the winter when it rains a lot and the sun goes down early at 6, I spend a lot of time in that living room sitting there reading. I'll look at the fish tank. I'll look out at nature through the windows. I'm happy I got rid of it. But I have the lost family members coming in thinking I'm just dumb for giving up my TV. Okay. Uh, my daughter, before I got saved, we had video games, movies. Uh, we did a lot of things that I won't do today because they're wrong. And after I got saved and got rid of them, there's a lot of times my daughter doesn't want to spend time with me because there's no video games here. There's no movies here. And no TV shows. I don't let her watch cartoons anymore because a lot of the cartoons, almost all of them, they have wickedness in it. They hide it in there. And as an adult, I can see it. As a Bible-believing Christian, I can see it. But she can't. And it's my job to take care of her, spiritually as well as physically. And when she gets old enough, she'll have to make that decision. It takes great courage, brothers and sisters, to make sure your home is a godly home. To not give in to the world.